All right, gang, this time I think it's working. We are having some technical difficulties. We'll get about one more moment as people tune in right now. Today's topic, supercell thunderstorm, severe weather, and tornadoes. Some of the craziest, the most interesting, the most dangerous, all those different things, weather on the planet. So, of course, come tune with te uh, que rather questions. We are so glad to have you, but bring your questions. We... Uh, going to do our best to answer anything you may be interested in, anything you want to know. And let's see, we have about 32 people tuning in right now. I know we have to switch streams due to some technical issues. Liam, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. For anyone who missed the first stream, we had just a few tech glitches. Lost internet for a moment. I think things should be back and should be steady, so we will be with you, hopefully, throughout the program today. It's going to be about 35, 40-ish minutes as we talk supercell thunderstorms, tornadoes, damaging wind, hail, some of which we can actually see in the D.C. area as well. So it's not stuff you only see in the Great Plains. Some of this can be local too, so it's important everyone knows how it works, the ins and outs of severe weather. And with that, I think we'll get going in just one moment. We are waiting for folks to tune in. Jason, good to see you. Thanks so much for having you. Jason, good to see you. Uh, Liam, good to have you as well. Amy, hi from Kyle, age nine. Kyle, good to have you as well. Henry, good to see you. Ben is in the Woodlands, Texas. Wow. Ben, good to have you from afar. You know, I love Texas. It's one of my favorite places for storm chasing. And, of course, I'm there quite often in May in the springtime. All right, we have about 63 people tuning in right now. More folks trickling in. And with that, we might as well get going. So we're talking all things severe weather today. Tornadoes, damaging thunderstorms, wind, hail, all that stuff. We'll talk about safety tips as well. So first things first, what makes a thunderstorm? We'll talk ordinary thunderstorms, then we'll differentiate between that and a severe thunderstorm. Now, supercells are the king of thunderstorms. They are rotating thunderstorms, and as a result, they produce damaging winds, large hail, and even tornadoes as well. So we'll talk about that, we'll talk about safety in a few minutes. Luke, age nine, good to have you. Sarah, age 12, Alexis, age nine. Awesome to see you guys. Iris in Silver Spring, age six. Iris, thank you for being here. Liam, Lucas, Addison, great to see you. Yeah, so we have a, a good gang today, and we're talking all about supercell storms. So if you remember from last week, we talked a little bit about cumulonimbus clouds, the really tall ones, and those are the ones that stretch all the way from the bottom of the atmosphere, sometimes up to 5 or 10 miles tall, and those are the ones that produce the most destructive storms, the big severe weather, the lightning, the thunderstorms, and sometimes the hail, the damaging winds, and tornadoes. And those are the ones we're talking about today. So we're talking about supercell thunderstorms, thunderstorms in general, but especially severe weather. Now, thunderstorms form because you have different temperatures in the atmosphere. Way high in the sky, you have cold air, and that allows the warm air near the ground to rise, kind of like if you're in a hot air balloon. Hot air balloons can only rise so long as the air inside them is warmer and less dense than the surrounding air, and that allows them to rise. Same thing is true with, with strong thunderstorms. You get those storms to rise and bubble up because the air inside them is warmer and less dense. Just kind of like boiling a pan of water. You watch those bubbles pop at the top. Twish and, El and Elena, 13 and 8, great to see you guys. Samuel in St. Louis says hi. Oh, awesome. Nolan's here as well. And Harris, age 7 in Arlington. Julia, age 10 from Fulton. Good to see you guys. So, when air begins to rise, you can see a towering cumulus clouds. We see those in the summertime. They kind of bubble up on warm, moist days. And sometimes they form storms, other times they don't. It's tough to tell which ones will, but when conditions are right, we know that at least one or two of those towering storms could become a strong thunderstorm. Now, eventually, when those clouds rise, they start to flatten out at the top. You might have noticed that. It looks like they have kind of a ceiling on top. And that's because they hit a level of the atmosphere called the stratosphere that they can't plow through. They can't go up there any further because it's so warm up there. And as a result, the air inside the clouds is no longer warmer, and it stops rising. It starts to flatten out. It's kind of like if you uncap a pot of boiling water on your stove. Eventually, all that steam will go up and flatten out on your rooftop or on the ceiling. And that's kind of exactly what happens at the top of a thunderstorm. So we'll talk about that as well. Now, the top of a storm is made of ice crystals. Down below, you have water droplets because way high in the sky, it's colder, and you get that ice to form. And that's how we produce hailstones as well. But that can also lead to charge separation. You get a difference in electrical charge, and that results in lightning. So jumping between the ice crystals and the water droplets. Leslie learned that in school one month ago. Awesome, Leslie. Kenny, we miss Camden. You can see Camden on Sundays, but I'll be your second choice, I guess. Ben, good to see you. Andrew, age seven as well. Awesome to see you guys. 
And of course, that charge separation between the ice crystals and the water produces lightning. Now, most storms don't last all that long. They start off as a towering cumulus cloud on the left. They kind of bubble up. They look like a heap of mashed potatoes or cotton balls. And eventually, the air goes up, cools off, forms rain, and starts to come back down. You see that cold air in the middle surging downward and spreading out. Now, that cho chokes off the storm, cuts off the updraft, and as a result, you get the storm to dissipate. And the whole thing can happen in less than one hour. That happens a lot in Florida in the summertime. They get a lot of storms down there, but most don't last all that long. Individual storms might only last an hour or so. They don't last all that long. If you want a storm to last, you need something else. You need shear. Shear is a change of wind speed or wind direction with height, and that causes the storm to sometimes rotate or to lean. And when a storm starts to lean, you can have the updraft go on one side and the downdraft elsewhere. And as a result, the downdraft, the cool sinking air from inside the storm, no longer chokes off the storm. In other words, it doesn't interfere with warm air rising into the storm, and you can have that storm last for a long time. Now, if the wind shear is just right, if the winds change direction with height, you can actually get that updraft to spin. So the inflow part of the storm, the air rising, will start to spin, and that can cause the whole storm to rotate. Now, from below the storm, you have these two different regions, the updraft on the left, which normally doesn't produce rain. The updraft is where air goes in. When air comes back down, it brings down the rain, the wind, the hail, everything with it, and that's why it looks a lot cloudier and rainier on the right side where the downdraft is. Let's see. Leslie misses school? Yeah, me too. So the updraft, that's where air enters the storm from below. It's warm, it's moist, it's a fuel for the storm. In strong updrafts, rain can't even fall because the air is moving upwards so quickly. Most raindrops fall at about 14 miles per hour. During the updraft, you can actually see ragged cloud bases, and that's where air is flowing in, and sometimes you get those chaotic motions. And tornadoes form in the updraft region because tornadoes are air moving up into the clouds, and so we'd be looking at the updraft region as to where those would form. The downdraft is where cool air crashes to the ground. It's usually accompanied by rain or hail. It can bring strong winds to the surface as well. Microbursts, very localized bursts of wind, can come down in the downdraft. Tornadoes don't form in the downdraft. Now, a supercell thunderstorm is the most important and the scariest type of thunderstorm. They are the most pretty, but also the most dangerous, and those are the ones you need to take the most seriously. It's just one lone storm. But because it's isolated, it doesn't have to compete with neighbors, it has a steady rotating updraft. This is kind of what a supercell looks like. This is a supercell I saw in Elk City, Oklahoma on May 16, 2017. And you can see this is one towering storm, rain and hail crashing down, down at the bottom. And then look, the whole thing spirals upwards with height. Air flowing in from the right, air flowing in from the left, and the whole thing is spinning like a top. This is what it'll look like from far away, and then look what happens as it gets closer. You can see that obvious rotation as the whole thing is spinning. It gets closer and closer, and then it's on top of us, and the entire storm rotates. Now, Joanne wants to know how big can tornadoes form. This is from Ben, age 7. Tornadoes can be about, eh, sometimes more than two miles wide. The record, El Reno, Oklahoma, back on May 31, 2013 at 2.6 miles wide. Previous record was Helm, Nebraska at 2.5 miles wide. Mark will talk about how long it takes for tornadoes to form in just a moment. Kirsten wants to know when is tornado season? Tornado season depends on where you are. In the mid-Atlantic, we can have it anywhere between like January and I'd say October. Most of our tornadoes form in the spring to summer months, but of course, as we saw a couple weeks ago, we can even get tornadoes in the wintertime. We had five of them on February 7th around here. Leslie wants to know, and that's from Emmett, age 8, where do you shelter in a storm? lowest floor of your home or business and you want to avoid windows putting as many layers between yourself and the outside world as you can now i want to tell you a story about one particular supercell i chased back on may 17th 2019 that was in mccook nebraska you can see it right here kind of tough to tell because it's far away at this point like 10 miles away but you'll notice on the left little conveyor belt of air flowing into it you see those clouds leading in that's inflow when I kind of switch the contrast, you can see a little bit better. That's air flowing into the storm's inflow, and that helps the storm to develop. Now, we started driving after the storm, and you'll be able to see the updraft really obviously right here. You'll see just after a second, in the Sand Hills of Nebraska here, you can see those ragged clouds at the bottom of the storm just like that. You'll see in just one moment. It's pretty impressive. So you see those ragged clouds right there. 
that's the updraft. And eventually we turn off onto a new road and look, that updraft, very visible on the left, extremely dark clouds rotating very quickly. Leslie loves Nebraska, yeah, me too. And you can see it right there, the downdraft on the right, but look how quickly things start spinning. This is in real time, and you can see those tendrils of cloud moving around. This is the updraft region, air flowing into the storm. And look how quickly it spins. And then eventually, I have a little time lapse for you. You can see it's moving towards us. So eventually we have to reposition and go a little bit farther east. Now this is the updraft getting closer to the ground. You can see it eventually starts to form a bit of a funnel cloud and the whole thing rotating pretty quickly right there, which is interesting to see. Now I want to show you what happens after this because eventually we do have a tornado form. We chased after this, you can see the updraft forming a couple little funnels right there. And we're in this region of the storm, east of the updraft. So you can see the whole thing, most storms, supercell storms, produce a hook. Inflow, warm, moist air flows in from the south. To the north, you have cool downdraft air. That's where the rain, the hail comes down. And it all starts to swirl on the back left side of the storm. We call that the hook echo. This is what it looks like on radar. On the left, you see a pretty bad tornado that hit Moore, Oklahoma in 2013. And you can see, radar shows the entire storm spinning, the tornado on the southwest side of the storm. So at this point, in Nebraska, I was in this region of the storm, looking west towards the wall cloud, towards the updraft, the cloud that sinks below the storm, where the funnel clouds will form. So here's where I was. That region of the storm and the inflow notch. You see that inflow notch right there, no rain falling, but I'm looking towards the updraft. The rear flank downdraft is this part over here. So you can see the downdraft over here. That's the rear flank downdraft. And that's the cool air on the back side of the storm that comes crashing around and can help tighten the circulation. We see in this animation the tornado and the wall cloud where the updraft is. But look, that rear flank downdraft on the left side, the cool air crashing down, can tighten the circulation at the wall cloud and help a tornado to form. And that's exactly what happened here. You see in the right, it's starting to clear. And that's where dry air is crashing down from above and eventually starts to tighten the rotation. And I'll show you in one moment exactly what that looks like because here is the funnel cloud starting to form. That punch of dry air on the left, you see the little clear air right there, that's where the air, the rear flank downdraft, is pouring in and filtering around the updraft. And you can see how quickly that is tightening right there. And look at that area of spin really start to organize. Funnel clouds forming down below as air fuels the updraft, and that's that rotating updraft that will eventually produce the tornado. We have a couple questions from folks. Chris wants to know, can tornadoes be in outer space? Chris, no, they cannot be. Aaron, age six, it looks like a tornado. Yeah, good question, uh, great point. Danielle wants to know, how fast can a tornado be? The strongest tornado on record was estimated by Doppler radar to be 318 miles per hour on May 3rd, 1999. Jesse wants to know, what is a water tornado called? It is called a water spout. Samuel, age 10, thinks this is awesome. Samuel, we think you are awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Any additional questions before we move on? We're talking about the rear flank downdraft. Cold air on the backside of a storm that can tighten the spin. So you see this right here. That little dry slot right there is helping to tighten that area of circulation. And it does. And eventually, look at that. You get the funnel clouds down bottom. And that forms into a tornado. So this is the first of many tornadoes that day between McCook and Culbertson, Nebraska. We're chasing after it right here. We were a little bit behind this because we got kind of caught up in traffic. Yeah, Mae wants to know, what's with the chain link fence in my car? That is actually to prevent hail from going through the windshield. We'll talk more about that in a second. You can see a special hail cage on top. But look at that tornado. It starts to undulate a lot, picks up all that dirt and debris. It actually destroyed a home. It was an EF2 tornado with 110 mile per hour winds. All that dirt being picked up, look right here, they kind of twisting. So that's showing you tornado is just beginning to weaken a little bit. So the cool thing about this tornado, it started to lean a lot because the storm was moving so quickly, the bottom of the tornado couldn't catch up. It was kind of like dragging the tornado so fast. It looked like something you would see in the Wizard of Oz because how weird it leaned and it's weird twisting motion as well. Joanne wants to know, can a tornado pick up anything? Well, the strongest tornadoes can destroy just about any man-made structures. So, yeah, for the most part, if you have a strong enough tornado, it can do just about anything. Now, this supercell rotating thunderstorm went through something called cycling. It's when one rotating updraft 
in a storm, the rotating up part of the storm, can reorganize. And each time it reorganizes, reshuffles, it has the capacity to produce a new tornado. And that's exactly what's happening here. Jill from Nolan Age 10 wants to know, can a tornado be perfectly straight? Yes, it can be if you have weak winds around it. So later on, the storm started to cycle, and we drove east after it as it's reorganized. Right we've got about hail, probably half dome, it's almost golf ball size. Thankfully, we have a hail cage on, but we are going to tilt it pretty well. And you can see a new tornado forming right here. And to your question a moment ago, no, one see this one's more up and down. And that's that tornado right there, almost straight up and down, Nolan. So pretty close. It started to lean eventually. Leaning is a surefire sign of which way a tornado is moving. You can see it pretty prominently right there. Now, Alexa, age six, can there be two tornadoes at once? Yes, Alexa. You can have up to about six to eight tornadoes at once under very rare circumstances. Let's see. Samuel wondering, are fire tornadoes common? We've had several examples. We had one near Redding, California of 143 miles per hour that killed five people a couple years ago in 2018 with the, I believe, the car fire. We had one in Canberra, Australia back in 2008 that had winds to 160 miles per hour. So genuine fire tornadoes are possible. Mary, age nine, wants to know how long tornadoes last. You can have tornadoes last on average about eh, three, four minutes, if that. But some, like the March 18th, 1925 Tri-State Tornado can last over three hours. How far away as a weather person do you stay? Alex, age nine, great question. Tornadoes are extremely dangerous. We don't want to be close to them, even though we're chasing them. So we always try to keep a safe distance of at least a quarter mile away. Deep Tea Dua, yes, and that's from Alana, age uh, uh, Elena. Can a tornado destroy entire towns? Yes. Greensburg, Kansas, back in 2008, was wiped out by a tornado. I've been there since, and the town, it did come back. It's redeveloped. The town originally had about 250 people, but there are still parking lots and foundations empty from where that tornado scoured away the town. Let's see. Any other questions before we move on? We're talking all things tornadoes. Now, if ever there's a tornado moving your direction, you should be inside on the lowest floor of your home or business and avoiding windows, preferably the basement or the most interior room away from windows. Trying to put as many layers between yourself and the outside world as you can. Tornadoes are dangerous. If ever you encounter a tornado, you want to be in this position, kind of crouching up, covering your head with your hands to protect from flying or falling debris. If there is a tornado going, you don't want to be high up. You want to be in the middle of your home. You want to be on the lowest level of your home. The basement is best. In the strongest tornadoes, you can't even survive above ground. You have to be below ground. No windows, nothing nearby. If you're in a car, that's extremely dangerous. You'd actually be better outside in a ditch away from your car than you would be inside your car. If you're in a mobile home, you would be better outside as well. In Canton, Texas, back on April 26, 2017, I got there a couple days later to survey the damage, and I saw mobile homes picked up and thrown away while the deck, the trellis, was still standing. It just goes to show you how weak mobile homes construction are, and that's why it's imperative you seek shelter in a site-built location. Now, average supercells keep an updraft and a downdraft separate. The rising air and the sinking air are in two different areas, but once in a while, you can actually have them kind of mix. Now, when you have average supercells keeping their updraft and downdraft separate, the wall cloud, the rotating part of the storm down bottom, is visible. Here's a tough to see one that I got in Matador, Texas back on May, I want to say May 23rd ish, 2019. And you can see right there the wall cloud just barely visible. That sinking cloud in the middle of the screen, that's where the air is rising quickly. And then all around it, cold, rainy air is wrapping around. And that's exactly what you see right there. It was actually kind of cool because you started seeing a green sky eventually, which was kind of scary to see. But the green sky results from all the rain and the hail inside the storm. Here's one more shot of that passing overhead. You can see the blue aquamarine color as the storm moves in. And there's one more look at the green sky. Yeah, Audrey, definitely. We would love if you would share this with people. We're so happy to anyone who shares this with friends, family, of course, with classmates as well. So definitely, please do that. We are happy to have this out there to as many people as possible. 
Now, some supercells have a downdraft that completely circles the updraft, meaning rain wraps all the way around the rotating part of the storm. And that makes it extremely dangerous because you cannot see any tornado, you can't see any wall cloud, you can't see anything coming at you. And those are extremely, especially dangerous. And that's why we say, seek shelter as soon as the warning is issued. Don't wait to see or hear it coming. You have to seek shelter as quickly as you can. Here's one a little bit west of Linwood, Kansas I got back last May. Now you can see very prominently the whole thing. There's rain on the left, but look, air moving one way, air moving in the other way. This is the updraft of the storm. I want to show you what it looks like in time lapse because you can see the clear rotation. So again, this is only over the course of about a minute and a half, how quickly the rain is circling around the updraft, making it impossible to see any circulation. You can see air in the foreground moving in from the south. On the right, air moving in from the right, and eventually the two start to circulate into a tornadic rotation. And then, you know what happened after that? A massive tornado, a mile-wide touchdown in the rain. It was a tornado no one could see, but a tornado that caused massive damage. And that is what we are chasing right here. tornado it is just to our northeast we are heading east we crossed the damage path a few minutes ago we're going to try to race and get ahead of it but right now it's all right guys massive tornado just through a mile wide and you can see this is some of the damage associated with this tornado and that's why we tell you tornadoes are extremely dangerous you do not want to be anywhere near them but if you are in the path you have to seek shelter on the lowest floor of whatever building you are oh whoops you have to seek shelter on the lowest floor of whatever building you're in. If possible, if you can get to a safer shelter, do that. But look at the damage caused by this massive rain-wrapped tornado. Tractor trailers picked up and thrown up to 100 yards, more than a football field. Trees denuded. This five to six ton vehicle picked up and thrown. The only thing left from this building, it was a massive building, was a basement way in that pile of rubble which is why we have to say the only thing that's safe during a tornado is to be in your basement. It's extremely important. There's a little piece of wood thrust into the ground as though it was a knife, so any flying debris can be deadly. Now, sometimes tornadoes aren't even visible. They are invisible, touching down, because after all, a tornado is made of air. And sometimes, if the air is dry, you can't see the condensation funnel, meaning there's not enough water in the air to turn into a funnel cloud that you can see. That happened with this particular storm near Tulsa, Oklahoma last year. I was chasing after this wall cloud, and you'll see what happens in just a second. So here's a wall cloud, here's in real time. This is real time, people. This is not a time lapse. And you can see how quickly things are moving right there. Look at that wall cloud spinning around, how low it is to the ground, only a couple hundred feet above the ground, barely a football field up. And then look, you see that little funnel just barely becoming visible right there. This whole thing extremely low to the ground. So eventually we chased after it, going farther off to the east. And you'll see in a moment that time lapse as this wall cloud passes ominously overhead. And wall clouds, the precursor to any tornadic activity. There you see it right there getting lower and lower. Now watch what happens. You go a couple miles farther off to the east, and you'll see in a second a little puff of dust where a circulation reaches the ground. So you see a little dust cloud way down there? That's a tornado. It's causing damage. It probably has winds over 80 miles per hour at that point. It's impossible to see because there's no condensation funnel. And that's why we say, even if you can't see it, there's a chance a tornado could be on the ground. Now, Lisa, uh, can tornadoes knock down skyscrapers? Yes, they can. I don't believe there have been ones that have been fully knocked down. There have been good-sized buildings severely impacted. And I know the Great Plains Life Building, I think in, was that in either Abilene or Fort Worth, Texas, years ago, back in the 1950s, was severely impacted by a tornado. All the windows gone. I think it was even twisted a little bit off its foundation and was condemned afterwards. Nashville has seen tornadoes before. Dallas has seen tornadoes before. The tornado in Joppa, Missouri on May 22, 2011, actually pushed the St. John's Regional Medical Center about six inches off its foundation, a massive concrete building off its foundation. Kirsten, why are tornadoes shaped like funnels? More air is exiting at the top than entering at the bottom, which is why it's wider at the top, shaped like a funnel. And that's a result in, or rather, that results in the low pressure in the middle that pulls the air inwards. Can animals sense tornadoes coming? 
Not really. Some animals, perhaps, you know, I, I'd venture to say probably not. Some animals might be able to detect the infrasound, meaning the very low frequency sound waves emanating from tornadoes. There's research into that right now, but for the most part, tornadoes are not something that animals can sense. People often note that earthquakes are detectable by animals in advance because they can sense the P waves in advance of the damaging surface waves from an earthquake, but otherwise, no, animals cannot sense tornadoes. Tornadoes do spin the opposite direction in South America. Eddie, age nine, great point. That is because the large-scale storm systems that are influenced by the Earth's rotation spin the opposite direction. Now, tornadoes are too small to feel the Earth's rotation, but the larger storm systems in which they're embedded that determine which tornadic supercells survive and which don't, the larger sco uh, scale storm systems do feel the Earth's rotation. Topography does affect tornadoes. Great question, Bob. Yes, you can have tornadoes even in the mountains. Tornadoes love it on the downslope side of the mountains, coming down the mountains because they get stretched vertically and that tightens their rotation. Ben H7 wants to know about how many tornadoes do we have in the United States every year? Roughly 11 to 1200. We are the tornado capital of the world. Now, air goes in thunderstorms. It also comes down in thunderstorms. And we call that the downdraft. That's where rain, hail, and strong winds can fall down the ground. This is what that looks like. Here on the right, you can see there's a downdraft, updraft on the left. But look at how it fans out when it hits the ground. That's a surefire sign it's bringing strong winds with it. Here's a microburst I encountered southwest of Tipton, Oklahoma, back in 2018. And you can see that burst of wind hitting the ground right there. Here are 90 mile per hour winds I got at night in Atoka, Oklahoma, back in 2019. And that's enough to move my vehicle about half a lane over while I was driving. Sometimes you can even have strong enough winds like this one in Texoma, Oklahoma, or rather Texola, to, to pick up and push semi-tractor trailers off the road, which is just terrifying. Here's another example. Let me see which one this is. Here's another shot of what can happen in the downdraft with some of the rain and the hail associated with air flowing out of a storm. Again, you see the downdraft down at the bottom. That's microburst down there with 80 mile per hour winds. And you can see this is a rotating supercell storm. Again, the same one in Elk City, Oklahoma back in 2017. But let's see if you can see it any better. Here's, here's real time. You'll see a time lapse in just a second associated with this storm. This was one of the most well-structured storms I have ever seen. And here we go farther south. You can see again in the middle that downdraft with all the air flowing down. And in there you have softball-sized hail. And that's, that's big enough to make a dent. Leslie, why do I chase tornadoes? I love them. I think they're fascinating, but at the same time, I dislike how damaging they can be. I love the science and the beauty behind them. But it is devastating to see what they can do to people, what they can do to lives, what they can do to families, structures, businesses. So yes, we do go out there looking for the science and the beauty, but we never go out there hoping to see it impact people. If we could, we'd love a good tornado out in the middle of a field, not impacting anyone. But unfortunately, that's not always a reality. It's, it's difficult to see the human impact. I saw that firsthand in Canton, Texas. I saw that firsthand in, in Kansas City. So here's a wall cloud, funnel cloud developing, but again, rain wrapping around it, preventing us from being able to see it. And actually, let me fast forward a little bit so we can get into the downdraft. So again, here's a rear flank downdraft. Here's on the backside of the storm. So rain and hail pouring down. Hail on the backside and the rear flank downdraft is a little bit tougher to see because there's usually like one hailstone and another hailstone far-ish apart. But you'll see in a second, this hail is big enough to actually wipe out my windshield. It was the size of softballs, four inches across. There you see other storm chasers passing by. And let's see, where's my mouse? Whoops. And here we get to the interesting part. Wait for it. Wait for it. Here comes the hail. So yeah, we had some pretty big hail. We decided afterwards to just pull off the highway. The only structure nearby was an overpass. You should never seek shelter from a tornado under an overpass. It's not even good to be underneath an overpass with hail because you could be blocking traffic, but I just wanted to make sure the vehicle was all right to continue driving onwards. 
and you'll be able to see in just a moment just how wild all this hail was. Most of it was about two and a half to two and three quarters inches across, so the size of a baseball. Let's see. Yeah, size of a baseball, but you'll see in a moment I take the camera outside just to show you what the hailstones are like out there. And look at all those. So you can see how huge that hail was. And then let me show you one more video just holding some of the hail. Of what just happened to our windshield. You can see these things are easily baseball size. So those were about baseball size. They're kind of shaped like miniature brains. We have some softball size ones as well. And then later on, a new wall cloud, an area of rotation formed as well. And here's that hail again one more time. Now sometimes, something else can kind of happen with these storms. Actually, I'll show you one more video of big hail. This is in the forward flank downdraft, so the leading edge of the storm, oh, oh, and there's more the hail there. Right On the back now, side of storms, there's less the hail, but it's bigger. You can, can also have big right hail right in the leading edge, but usually there's more of it. Okay, guys. And you can see it right there like that. Now, sometimes with the downdraft, it can actually surge ahead of a storm. You can have what's called the forward flank downdraft, go ahead of a storm, and produce an outflow boundary. Outflow boundary means there's air exiting the storm, and that's what you see right here. That's the leading edge of a storm where cold air is kind of kicking up the air, and that's why it produces that crazy boundary. Now in Texas, in the desert southwest, in Arizona, New Mexico, sometimes you get enough dust to be kicked up by that outflow boundary to create what we call a haboob. That's a dust storm. You can see them near the railroad crossing right here because I was well, I was chilling near the railroad crossing because they're like trains. But off in the distance, you see a little bit of dust being kicked up. And then look, we get closer and get closer. And then, wow, a lot of dust all in there. And actually, I'm just going to move my computer real quick, so bear with me one moment. You can see all that dust back there as this dust storm moves into Lubbock, Texas last year. And, and Leslie wants to know, how much hail did I collect? I actually have a freezer in my truck that I, I collect hail in. Because why not? It's cool. And there again, you see that leading edge of the dust coming in. And it's kind of cool because the dust shows you where the cold air from the downdraft is. And you can see it sloping along the ground, kind of sloshing outwards. Now, one other cool thing, sometimes outflow boundaries or cold fronts can collide with other boundaries. In this case, you have a dry line. So the boundary between moist air and dry air in the foreground, this is in Clovis, New Mexico. And that's the top cloud you see there. And then in the distance, you have the cold front. The cold front is coming in. That's kind of the trigger for new storms. And you can see towering clouds along it. And that produced big time storms later on that night that made massive lightning and all sorts of stuff. But the best part of storms is on the backside. You sometimes get amazing views like this right here. These are mammatus clouds on the backside and it is the best part of a storm. Mammatus clouds aren't dangerous. They're beautiful and when you catch the sunlight just right, it can make for an otherworldly scene just like this. So with that, that is the end of my formal talk for today. I'd love to take any questions and just answer any curiosities y'all might have, because I know we talk a lot about severe weather, supercells, tornadoes, everything like that. So any questions, do let us know. Let's see. Any questions, let us know. Jennifer wants to know, when was I the most scared? You know, Jennifer, the tornadoes don't scare me because those are somewhat predictable from my standpoint. The two things that scare me the most when storm chasing, other drivers. Other drivers out there scare the heck out of me because sometimes you have people who aren't following the rules of the road. You have people who are not paying attention to where they're going. So the other drivers scare the bejesus out of me. Lightning scares me too. I've had three close calls because lightning is, is sometimes the most dangerous. It is unpredictable. You can't tell when it's going to hit and it really does terrify me. Christine wants to know, can we do floods? Yeah, we can talk about floods. Drew Hubbard, good to see you. Drew, I know we normally chat about severe weather a lot, so Drew, glad to see you're tuning in right now, and thank you very much for your enthusiasm and comments. Let's see. Can you alert from a microburst of tornadoes? Because in Leesburg, Virginia, there was one we were notified. Jennifer, yes. Sometimes we can tell when a microburst is possible. Most of the time, we don't see them until they're in progress on radar, but we can see the conditions that give rise to them based on how much water is in the upper levels of a storm. We call that vertically integrated liquid. 
And when we see there's a lot of water up there and not a lot to support that water, we know, okay, this water will likely crash towards the ground and bring cool air with it. Chris wants to know, can three tornadoes form at once? Yes, that can happen. We had two, actually three tornadoes at a time back in 2016 in Dodge City, Kansas. It was an awesome storm. I was not there at that point, but yeah, it was an impressive event to say the least. Two F4 tornadoes at the same time in Pilgrim, Nebraska a couple years ago as well. May wants to know what is the worst tornado ever recorded. There were more than 700 deaths with a tornado in Bangladesh. There were hundreds killed, I believe. Was it over 600 killed from the Tri-State Tornado many years ago, which moved across portions of, I want to say, Illinois, Kentucky, and Indiana, but I'd, I'd have to go back and double-check on that. Additional questions. Jax wants to know, what is the fastest tornado I've seen? I've seen an F4, so winds to 170 miles per hour. We are right next to that one. Christopher wants to know, and that's from Christina, age 8, why is the hail so big? It's so big because the updraft needed to support that hail and cause it to grow in the storm was super strong, and that held it high in the storm clouds long enough that you could actually get a very strong updraft and big hail. Do they have tornadoes in Europe? Yes, maybe they do have tornadoes in Europe. Most, I believe, are undercounted, so we don't count them. We don't always know how many there are because some happen in rural areas without many people around to see them, but yeah. Can we do drought? Jesse, yeah, maybe we can talk about floods and drought at some point. That would be pretty cool to talk about. Any other questions, do let us know. What is your favorite tornado you've seen in person? You know, I liked one of the ones I saw near, I want to say Culbertson, Nebraska, because it was away from towns, it didn't hurt anybody, and it just put on a good show. I like the ones that don't impact people. I've seen stronger tornadoes, but those have been impactful, and I don't like those because those disrupt lives. Leslie wants to know, can we move on? Leslie, this is the end of the presentation. We're taking questions right now. We've gone through 70 slides. We've seen many cool things. So now it's question time. Let's see. Thanks for letting me watch. Iris, age six. Oh, Iris, it was great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Drew said your mom took some pictures in the aftermath of Moore, Oklahoma. Yeah, I bet it was intense. More, I've been to Moore many times since, and it's amazing how resilient that community is and how well they have recovered. Any other questions? Let us know. We'll stick around for about two more minutes. Joy says she'd love to see something on snow and blizzards. Yeah, maybe we can do blizzards. We'll do experiments later this week as well. Alexa, age six, can there be tornadoes in any place? There have been tornadoes in every state and territory in the country. We've had tornadoes in Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico. There have been tornadoes in Hawaii, even a tornado in Alaska years ago, which is pretty cool. Henry, age 11, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Now, you can have tornadoes in most areas. You can't have them in Antarctica. Too cold down there. Probably not near the North Pole. You can have winter water spouts up there, which are kind of similar. Let's see. What else? Christine wants to know, what is the worst tornado? Christine, depends on worst. We talk widest, fastest, most intense, deadliest, costliest, many different metrics to measure worst. Raleigh, age nine, can we do hurricanes? Raleigh, we did hurricanes last week. You can tune into Fridays if you scroll back on Facebook, or we can send you the link on YouTube as well. Casey, age 13, I love storm chasing because you can see the beauty and power of the atmosphere. Every day you see something new, different, unique, it is a challenge to see. It is a, an exercise, sort, sort of, to forecast and to try to realize the fruits of one's forecast and see how well I can do. Harris wants to know how tall a tornado is. It depends on something called the lifting condensation level, LCL. That determines the height at which the cloud base will form, and tornadoes form between the ground and the cloud base. How much is a lot of damage for tornadoes? Kylie, age 8. You can have tons of damage. You can have miles and miles of damage, sometimes up to a mile wide. Anna H. Anna Henderson, age 11, thanks so much for being here. Leslie, can we do a video get Leslie, I don't know what you're saying. No, we're not playing video games here. Let's see, anyone else have a question pertinent to weather? Pertinent to weather or severe weather, we can answer today. We'd be happy to. If, if we miss your question, we'll try to swing back and get back to it via commenting on Facebook. And of course, if there's anything you want to see, let us know. If you have questions that we can answer, if you have suggestions for next topics, things you want to see next week, let us know. We are happy to talk about it. And with that, I think we will let you go.
Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sticking around. Thanks for coming with your questions. And as always, thanks so much for chatting weather. We really do appreciate it. Bye, gang.